basically what we do is that we monitor our clients' networks 24 hours a day against an SLA, and we protect our clients from the adversaries, which means people who are trying to hack, deploy ransomware, whether it is they've got cloud-based, whether it's on-prem, whether it's application, we monitor them 24. Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Business Ninjas. I'm here today with Ferris Tapuni. He's the CEO and founder at Security HQ. Ferris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Yeah, excited to have you. So Ferris, why don't you start and tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, great question. I'm an engineer by heart. That's where I, that's the way I think. That's the way I kind of do my day-to-day -day job. I started out, believe it or not, as a mechanical engineer many, many years ago and ended up in the cyber world. On a personal level, I'm a family man. I got my two boys. I'm passionate about sports, watching any kind of sports, but particularly, obviously, soccer, as you guys would say in America, football, as we'd say in Britain, Liverpool Football Club is my massive passion, rugby, cricket, but even getting into the NBA and the NFL as I'm here now in the US. Oh, I love it. I love it. So talk to me a little bit about kind of your journey getting to where you are now at Security HQ. Well, I founded Security HQ. We're not a startup, but it must have been about 17 years ago I founded, and I was always in the security business. And 17 years ago, the cyber world was very much in its early days, infancy. Only the high-end companies were working on it. So I transitioned as a professional from being in security, working in counterterrorism and understanding terrorism organizations, and then slowly moved my engineering knowledge and my basis towards the cyber, which yeah. sounds like a big transition. It would be nowadays, but back in the day, it was such an infancy that you could do that. I don't think you could do that now. Yeah. Um, and just slowly started building up the business back then to what it is today. That's fantastic. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what Security HQ, what you do. Okay. Well, Security HQ within the business is known as an MSSP. And I don't like acronyms, but that stands for a managed security service provider. Basically, what we do is that we monitor our clients' networks 24 hours a day, against an SLA and we protect our clients from the adversaries, which means people who are trying to hack, deploy ransomware, whether it is they've got cloud-based, whether it's on-prem, whether it's application, we monitor them 24-7. Yeah, yeah. We do this at a significant scale now. So we have security operations centers, what's called a SOC, that's what, uh, you know, security operations center stands for, and those are where some of the most talented cyber, you know, analysts and engineers. Currently, our head counts about 410 globally around the world. And we do it for the great, the good, the ugly, the bad, all of them. We do it all. So that's really interesting. So talking about man being a managed security service provider, an MMSSP, so, you know, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm new to the cybersecurity world. So do you find that your clients tend to interact before there's an issue or after there's an issue? Because obviously everyone always wants to be, you know, on the, you, you want to have the systems in place before you need it. But talk to me a little bit about that. Well, basically our clients, our clients have come to a realization, um, especially the more, more educated, mature clients understand that they don't have the capabilities in the house. They also understand that the adversaries, the attackers, are 24 by 7 as well. So they need somebody who's got their back, right? They actually not need somebody. They need an army of people. And, and I could spend the next three hours, which I won't, talking to you about tech and what we do and how we do it. But ultimately, if you were to ask our clients, why do they come to Security HQ? And they'll say it's because of the people. Because, A, I know that while I'm asleep or I'm having dinner with my family or while I'm doing my day job, I've got you guys monitoring my network 24 by 7. Mm -hmm. Also, most importantly, there's no point having the capability to monitor and detect if you have no capability to respond. Mm -hmm. So the response is also, you know, a huge element. Again, how do we do that? It comes from a mix 
of different types of people, different seniorities from L1s, L2s, L3s, threat intelligence, all these different components come to make this beautiful cake that gives us the capability uh, you know, to do this. And it's, it's not an easy ask. Our clients are extremely demanding. For their job as a client working with Security HQ is basically, are you sure you're monitoring? They keep checking on us, making sure we're on it. Yeah. Um, they get a weekly call. They want to see the traffic. They want to see the vulnerabilities. They want to see who's attacking them, why they're attacking them, all these kind of things. What can they do to improve their network? Yeah. And what we like to do is to take our what we call our clients, we take them on a, a journey. So you started here and slowly, because we're seeing you, like going to the gym every single week, it's the same mm -hmm. thing. You're supposed to get leaner, fitter, healthier. So when you come under attack, A, you're defended. B, if you do get breached, you will be, you know, you'll be up and running quickly. Mm -hmm. And finally, if you do get breached, then there's an army of people to help you get yourself out of it, mm -hmm. right? And that's the whole thing. And then there is no, there's no security company can ever guarantee that somebody doesn't get a breach. If you guys hear anybody saying, oh, we can guarantee, it's a lie. Yeah. It's a complete lie. For the simple premise, security professionals such as myself and my team, we have to be right 100% of the time. The bad guys only have to be right once. Mm -hmm. and so the odds are not fair, but that's, you know, that's the way it is, which means that we accept you can't always get it right. And when you, but we will not accept that we can't turn it around. And when you're talking about your clients, do you, you know you mentioned mature clients tending to be the clients that that works with Security HQ? Is there a certain industry or you know size client that you tend to see working best with Security HQ? Um, it's now it's extremely diverse, but in the sense of traditionally it was always more government and financial, and that still represents probably the largest portion. But why? Because they're they're highly regulated. Okay, so the highly regulated industries, healthcare as well, a bit of education, they're always going to be compelled to do this. But I want to clarify the maturity. The maturity doesn't mean an old company or a wealthy company or a wealthy organization. It actually means they're just mature with their knowledge of their own capabilities, their own shortcomings, and they go, actually, I can't, we can't do this. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily you would be shocked some of the brand names that we come across and work with, and they're so immature, to some of the smaller companies you've never heard of that will push our level to the highest level, and they will push our engineers and their knowledge of networks as well. It comes down to those individuals, ultimately, I suppose, that drives it. But originally, it's still coming more and more compliant-driven. Yeah. And all governments around the world are currently not only legislating, there is new legislation coming out. Uh, governments under extreme scrutiny to actually get their get their companies and their infrastructure, make sure that within their countries they're stepping up to the mark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So I'm I'm curious. You know, we you you hinted at it a little bit, and I want to make sure that I'm hearing you right because I imagine that people who may not be as well versed in cybersecurity you are don't understand how highly regulated the cybersecurity world is would you say that's a common misconception yeah. or would you say you know what what would you say the biggest misconception in the industry would be i think the biggest mis you know biggest misconception is actually the clients themselves um, it's amazing how our clients will say to me okay i am a distribution company i run trucks mm -hmm. and actually when you look at them and you see how they operate and the apps and how they track the trucks, how they do everything on their CRM, how they load and how you're like, you're an IT company. You just don't know it. Yeah. Because you try and go 15 minutes of your day without your computer and try to achieve anything mm -hmm. and, you know, productive. It's close to impossible. So that's where you particularly, particularly with certain customers saying, guys, you're not a trucking company. You don't even own these trucks. You're leasing them. You don't even own your drivers. You don't actually own anything. Everything is run on custom applications that you've built. Mm. And actually, which makes you an IT company. So once you start thinking like that, yeah. you start bringing in IT solutions to help you with your IT footprint and understand it. Mm. 
you'll also very quickly come to the realization, the risks that you are running. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is again, that sadly, a lot of people don't report is the number of smaller, medium sized companies that cannot afford the ransomware and who are truly taken down. Mm -hmm. And if then, I mean, they're put out of business and it happens daily. And not only put out of business, even the ones that don't get put out of business, it sets them back two years on their plan. Mm -hmm. That's a huge, you know, that's a huge amount when you think about the lifespan of a company as we work. It's a lot of percentage you give away for one incident. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine, too, talk about tarnishing a name as well. Like if you've got, oh. you know, talk to your clients that, you know, we were hacked, unfortunately. Like, you know, we live in a world where I think the expectation is that your security, like you trust companies to protect your data and all of that. So I imagine too, like, you know, certainly it, it's harmful for companies, you know, in, in their terms of their daily operations, like you said, but also too, you know, for their own brand, you know, being, being secure, you know, trusting customers trust as well. If you, if you look, you know, the key word where you said there's the word trust, right. And you, if you think how you buy things, why you buy things in the supermarket or why you buy things online, invariably it's built on brand loyalty, which is trust driven. And that's no different on a B2B business. Yeah. I will use Kelsey Incorporated because I know Kelsey, she never lets me down. I trust her, even though she's a little bit more expensive. Now, if that gets eroded because all of a sudden you're not running your networks properly, you can't sort out your own house. Should I give you my credit card details? I don't know whether some of my invoices were put online on the dark web yeah. or I don't know where this is going to, that erodes trust and trust is the easiest thing to lose in life. Yeah. We know it from our personal lives, right? Yeah. Our friends and family and boyfriends and girlfriends. That's the easiest thing to lose. And it is the hardest thing to get back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it actually leads me on to another thing that when people say, why do people buy stuff from Security HQ? I always train my sales executives. Mm -hmm. I go, it's a trust sale. Mm -hmm. Everything's about trust. They feel that you can do it, mm -hmm. money becomes secondary. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering too, on the on the topic of trust, you mentioned that there's a weekly call with the engineers, kind of a yeah. state of you know how everything's operating. Is that done through a platform? Like, talk to me a little bit about that. So that's a great question. So apart from the monitoring, the 24 by seven, and you see all the alarms, all the traffic, and you have access to all our tools that we do. But actually our, our customers, I'm not cybersecurity professionals, a lot of them are IT guys or, you know, guys and girls, but they're, but they're not in the detail of it like we are. So the customers demanded that actually I'd like to have a weekly call where I go through an individual report that is delivered to me prior. And that comes through on our app. They get to see on the application, but actually I need a cybersecurity professional. And these are not account managers, guys. These are proper cyber guys who talk you through your network. And these calls range generally between 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending if there's an issue. And they're the single point of contact. And they're going through every alarm they've seen, mm -hmm. why you've seen it, what you've seen before, what mitigation steps you've got to do, mm -hmm. what are the issues is. That's the, what we call like the drumbeat call. And that happens 56 times a year, whatever it is, or 52, whatever it is, I can't remember. X, X number of weeks a year, whatever it is. And you get that. That's part of the service. But most importantly, that's one part of it. If something happens, you will get a phone call. They will wake you up in the middle of the night. And then bang, you're on, you'll be told to get to your computer and either we will commence mitigation measures to try to do it if you've given us permissions to do that. But then it's the same guy or girl that you speak to will lead the charge. So you have that trust with that individual and sometimes, and we, I think our record is 36 hours where we've been on a call with a customer nonstop 36 hours. Ooh. But yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, that talks about building the trust and, you know, talking about how far security HQ is willing to go for, you know, its clients, because that, you know, seriously, you know, can very much ruin a business. So taking yeah. the time to put in those hours to make sure that company, you know, is able to bounce back from, from the breach is, is so important. But it makes perfectly good business sense to us. It sounds, you know, if you spoke to the accountants, and I'm sorry for the accountants listening out there, they'd be like, how much was the cost of a call or whatever it is? Yeah, that's true. But you go speak to a customer that was in complete blind panic. They thought their business was falling apart. 
they get ransomware profilated across their network. Yeah. And then when Security HQ is on the call for 30 hours, as an example, and we never left the call, and all the teams around the world come in to help, you that customer will never leave you. Never. Never, ever leave you. And not only that, he'll go, he or she will go and tell five other people that, and those guys, they had my back. Mm-hmm. And then it goes back again, back to the trust thing, right? Yeah. It happens. Sadly, we we do see it at least once a month. And the 30 hours was an extreme, but six, seven hour calls are standard. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, but we also learn from a business as well, yeah? It sounds funny. You know, like doctors and nurses in an ER room, you learn quite often by what you see. Mm-hmm. So it, it also keeps us on our toes. So yeah. I got paid to do. Yeah, right. That's really interesting. So I imagine through over the course of, you know, with changing technologies, I imagine Security HQ has seen a lot of growth. You said it over the past 17 years. Talk to me a little bit about what that growth has looked like. Well, it's massive. So the growth within our business is is that, we started, as I said, 17 years ago. It was myself and a couple of other guys. We pulled together this little business that now is 400 and whatever it is, plus people, hundreds of clients, and six operation centers around the world. Um, but it's still privately owned. I still am the founder, and I'm the, I own the business with my partners as well. Um, we have no private equity, no venture capitalists within our business. We built this business one customer at a time. So growth has been huge, but I'm still, we still scale it right. We still do it the way we do it. Yeah. It works for us, right? It really does work for us. Yeah. And it means that we can open a center like we have done here in the US mm-hmm. and our reputation slowly comes with us, right? And it creates a lot of wealth as in wealth of customers, not wealth as in money, wealth as in customers that we get hundreds of people approach us daily for business. Wow. So it's good. That's it's fantastic. Good. That's great. So, you know, people wanted to learn more about Security HQ. Where would they go to learn more? They can go to securityhq.com. They can see me on quite a few little YouTubes. They can email me at for us at securityhq.com. I have no issue with that. I'm very approachable. I, I hope, hope you found that. Kelsey. Um, and then my team will jump onto anything and, and we can have a, a conversation with them. It's that right. simple. Fantastic. It always starts with a conversation, a simple conversation. Mm-hmm. And building that trust. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. oh, that's great. So, Ferris, as we start to wrap up this conversation, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with, either you know about cybersecurity, the industry, security HQ, anything you want to leave our listeners with? I think I think what what I would say to the customers is that I know you'll get a lot of people out there who will talk about the Russians and the Chinese and what's going on in Syria and Ukraine. That doesn't necessarily affect you, your mind, as in you go, that doesn't work for me. I'm running this company here in this state. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's not an excuse not to look at your own network, to understand, well, what happens if something did happen? How confident I am that I'm going to be doing it? And I'm going to quote the law, and the law, right? Ignorance is not an excuse, right? You can't say, you cannot say to a judge, well, I just didn't know the law. The judge will never accept it. So I'm saying to you, take the time, understand your network. There are some great tools out there. There are experts in my team, myself, who will help. Just reach out to us. If, if, if it doesn't fit for us, we'll say, you're too small, you're too big, you whatever it is, that's fine. But make sure you've got some resources there because it is your network. It is your company. It needs to be taken care of properly. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice to leave our listeners with, you know, Ferris, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you breaking down, you know, all of the growth with Security HQ, all the things that you've seen over, you know, your 17 years of experience just with Security HQ and your rich, your rich background before that. So I think this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you being on Business Ninjas today. Thank you. Appreciate it as well. Thank you very much. Great to have you.